everybody. Um, all right, so we're in the last little bit of chapter 18. We have a couple uh, reactions to talk about that are, you know, there's a little bit of depth to them, but we can get through them pretty quickly. Um, what was, what were we doing at the end of chapter 18 last time? Like the topics. We were talking about 1 2 edition versus 1 4 edition. Particularly organometallic reagents, which are things that have a metal in them, right? Like we know, Grignards and organolithiums are organometallic reagents. We also know that now we know that copper reagents or cuprates are also organometallic reagents. So we really have magnesium, lithium, and copper as of now. Um, anyway, so this this is showed kind of like what a one-two addition is. This is all essentially your organic one stuff, right? Like a Grignard or an organolithium would react with a ketone. And, and we're specifically we're talking about these enones that have like a double bond next door. Uh, so Grignards and organolithiums do this thing where they attack the ketone, right? And this is just like, like your old organic one stuff, right? The double bond doesn't play any part at all. And that's what we call a 1-2 addition. A 1-2 addition. The 1-4 addition is going to be the alternate, alternative pathway where the nucleophilic thing attacks the double bond. And that happens with copper or cuprates. Okay? So this is all from last time. The mechanism, of course, is really simple. It just attacks, and then you get an O minus, O minus gets a proton, and you're done. Now with the cuprates, um, with the cuprates, the first of all, the structure of the cuprates is a little different. You have two of the R group thing connected to copper and lithium. All right, so the and whatever it is, it attacks. It attacks from the end position, and you get it kind of attached there. And this is what we call a 1-4 addition, right? So basically your, your R group, which is the thing on the copper, winds up at that 4 position with the uh, where the double bond was, right? The mechanism is really similar to the other one, except that the addition takes, and, and we just kind of consider phenyl 2 copper lithium as essentially phenyl dot dot minus, right? So it's a benzene dot dot minus. And it's just a special one. The copper ones attack the double bond. And the mechanism, mechanistic details of that is really beyond this course. Okay, so it attacks, and then you just get an enolate, and then now the enolate gets a proton from water, and you get back your ketone. All right? Cool. So that's the 1-4 addition of cuprates. We also mentioned how to make them. How do you make a cuprate? Uh, so you just take an alkyl halide or aromatic halide and you react with lithium. That gives you the organolithium, basically the organic one chemistry, right? And then we react the lithium, two molecules of the lithium with copper iodide, and uh, that attaches basically both phenyls to the copper, and then you get lithium iodide as a byproduct. Uh, that's what it looks like. PH2 copper lithium, right? You have two phenyls. That's a, that's a hor horribly drawn one, but it's that's a benzene. Those are both benzenes. Copper lithium, right? All right. Um, and then uh, reviewing how how can we make these things? This is like a you know what a cuprate might react with uh, alkene next to a ketone. One of the ways is if you have a ketone, you can just uh, alpha brominate it with Br2 acetic acid, and that puts the bromine at the alpha position. Pyridine does an E2 style elimination reaction where the, the base takes the proton, makes a double bond, kicks out the Br. So that gives you that. And this is just an example of, you know, what was what, what one of the things we could do. Well, we could do a cuprate addition, copper lithium, ethyl copper lithium, or ET2 copper lithium. And it would just attach there. It's just like a, a beautiful use of a cuprate. Of course, the nice thing is, that, like, if we wanted to, we could now do a Grignard addition to the ketone, right? Because Grignards attack ketones, and like do like basically attach a second R group, but at the oxygen position there, at the ketone position, and make a tertiary alcohol. So yeah, that's a, that's a common sequence. Is like take a ketone, turn it into an enone, enone, right? Alkene ketone. Do a cuprate and then do a Grignard addition, and we did that kind of thing as a potential synthesis problem 
here that I, I, I showed you at the end of class last time of like, okay, if you have a ketone and you want to turn it into like a, you know, tertiary alcohol with an R group down here where the, at this beta position, you could do the above sequence, which makes a double bond, and then first do a cuprate addition, like terbutyl cuprate, for example, and then uh, take the Grignard and uh, ethyl Grignard and react it with the ketone and make the tertiary alcohol. All right, cool. All right. All right. So we got two last topics. In chapter 18. First one, um, and we're, we're kind of in this theme of conjugate addition. Conjugate addition, and conjugate addition is another name for 1 4 addition. Okay, so we know about 1 4 addition, which is like the cuprates and stuff like that. But what if you have a, do you want to do conjugate addition of an enolate? anion nucleophile. Well, that's another reaction, and we haven't talked about it yet. Um, the thing is, there's going to be two ways to do this, and they both have names. So, a lot of chemistry and chemical reactions have names of old, I think pretty certainly uh, dead old chemists. Uh, one of the methods is going to be called the Michael reaction. And this is going to be the easier one. So we first do this one. This simple demonstration of this idea of uh, enolate anion nucleophile doing a conjugate addition. And then we're just going to have another one which is called the Robinson annulation reaction. So this is going to be the, the slightly more complicated one and we'll do that in our next section. So it's basically, it's a the, the Robinson is essentially going to be a Michael plus more steps. It's going to be a Michael and then there's going to be a couple, couple more steps. All right. All right. So let's go through these two now. Okay. So let's do that Michael reaction. And the Michael reaction is really the, the simplest example of this. It's just a, a one four addition, which we know what that means, right? of an enolate. A one four addition of an enolate. Of course you need, you're always, a, uh, well that's the nucleophile, right? Uh, the enolate's the nucleophile and you're attacking something, usually that, that enone concept, right? Okay, so let's just, sh let's show the, the example of this, of the Michael reaction. The Michael reaction. Alright, so I'm gonna take a ketone like acetophenone, acetophenone. And I'm going to react it with a enone. Okay, I'm, this specific enone uh, would work really well for Michael. We'll talk about, you know, what what makes a good uh, Michael electrophile versus a bad one in a second. Um, I'm also going to give these guys some sort of names or like initials. I'm going to call this, which is the nucleophilic side, this is going to be, you know, you're going to convert this to an enolate, and it's going to go attack this guy. Uh, Michael Donor, MD. So I abbreviate this MD for Michael Donor. And what's the opposite of a donor? An acceptor. So this is going to be the MA, the Michael acceptor, all right? So the donor is essentially going to attack the acceptor. That's all there is to it. Um, and when I react these, and I'm going to use, for the next couple reactions, we're going to use specific uh, basic mixture 
NaOET, sodium ethoxide, and ethanol. I think previously for the aldols, we've been doing like NaOH and water, but for the Michael reaction, and also this Robinson that we'll see in a second, uh, it's NaOET and ethanol, sodium ethoxide. Okay. Uh, the basic uh, product is just going to be these two things will be attached. And ketone. Okay, no, with no double bonds or anything, they just, you know, that, that attacks there and makes that. Um, one thing you should know about the, these, the, the product of a Michael reaction, the, this is a product of a Michael reaction, is that the, the arrangement of the two ketones is, has a specific, like, numbering almost. It's like one, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five. And I call this the product of a Michael reaction. I call a 1,5 dicarbonyl. Okay. A 1,5 dicarbonyl. So if you draw something that looks like a 1,4 dicarbonyl, then you messed up. Or if you draw a 1,6 dicarbonyl, you messed up. The product of a Michael is always a 1,5 dicarbonyl, and you can kind of, you should always double check that, right? So, um, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right. So yeah, products of Michaels are one five dicarbonyls. What's the product of an aldol? Remember aldols? They have a, they always have a product too, right? The aldol has its a product designation, and the Michael has a product designation. Other reactions we'll see will have the de designations, but. One way to learn these reactions is by memorizing the designations of it, right? So Michael is a 1,5 dicarbonyl. What was the product of an aldol? I'll just you know, review that real quick. Like if I take acetone and I react it and with NaOH, you get that, right? That's an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. So that, that's a simple aldol, right? Um, anyway, so my point is that memorizing, not only do you kind of memorize the reactions, but it's helpful to memorize the designation of the product as part of the reaction. Aldols make alpha-beta unsaturated ketones. Michaels make 1,5-dicarbonyls. And we're going to have other reactions, and they have their own designations. So good to start thinking about that now. All right, so what's the mechanism of this? Um, a base will do what to your Michael donor? What do bases do? Do things. They re they deprotonate them, right? So all we're doing is making an enolate. Take a take the key, alpha proton off the ketone. Make an enolate. Now you got an enolate. What do enolates do? They act as nucleophiles. So this is going to be a nucleophile on this, which is the electrophile. And that's pretty much the whole reaction. It's very straightforward. Okay, so we got our the nucleophilic side. So, and then one, two, three, four, five. But here we still, we have an enolate temporarily. And then to finish this off, it's either water or ethanol or, or something. Uh, probably ethanol, we have a lot of ethanol around. So yeah, this just grabs a proton and, and you're done. Okay? And that makes the 1,5 dicarbonyl uh, product. Another um, example, so that was a pretty simple example. Uh, we can also just change the, do the reagents slightly different and uh, we can preform the enolate. Preform enolate. Because we're in, with using sodium ethoxide, it's not a super strong base. So when it makes this enolate, it's kind of in equilibrium. 
right? But what, what if we just take this and just use a super strong base, and just rip off that proton and make the enolate? Well, it does the same exact thing. So I'll just show an example of that. Preforming the enolate. Another way we can do this is like. Um, We'll take cyclohexanone as our, is it Michael Donor or Michael Acceptor? Donor or Acceptor? It doesn't have a double bond, so it must be the donor. So this is an MD. Let's, in this case, we'll do one LDA, super strong base. This is definitely a super base, right? Very, one of, one of the stronger bases we use in organic chemistry. LDA, and then let's react it with this will be our Michael acceptor MD or Michael acceptor MA and like H2O or you need a need some kind of proton source at the very end All right. here we used ethanol because it's part of the reaction mixture but here we actually have to add like a, a explicit proton uh, source okay I'll draw the product and I'll go through the mechanism okay so what is the what kind of products are Michaels? They're always 1,5 dicarbonyls. You can imagine it's just going to be that carbon attached to that carbon in a 1,5 dicarbonyl manner, right? So it's going to be we got two carbons here, tributyl basically, right? Mechanism is exactly the same as above. We're just using a super strong base this time. So base takes the proton. I'm going to just draw the enolate. Okay, we got our enolate. Now we use the Michael acceptor. So the O minus swings in. This goes there, this goes there, this goes there. All right. It's going to look very similar to the product now, but it's, but it's an enolate. And how do we finish this off? Now you now you use your water that's around. Let's draw water up here, wherever. And now the enolate just grabs that proton. So O minus swings down, double bond, attacks, kick off hydroxide and you get your final product, okay? Cool. All right. Um, so one thing to realize now, we have these two examples, right? They're very similar. It's just in one case we're using sodium methoxide and ethanol. The other case we're like, we use a super strong base throw in the Michael acceptor and then we just use water as a as the protonation source. Um, and what was the what was the other reaction? We have a we're, we have a Michael reaction, which is kind of what we're talking about now. And then the Robinson is going to be the next the, the slightly more complicated one. And we'll show that in a second. But the difference between the Michael and the Robinson is that um, is this. Uh, note In, all, in both of these examples, the Michael acceptor which is the MA, right? Uh, lacks an enolizable proton CH. And these enolizable CH and this is on the on the opposite side of the alkene. What do we mean by that? Um, the Michael acceptor, the MA, lacks an enolizable CH on the opposite side of the alkene. What I mean by that is, if it, let's go look at look at this one, this Michael acceptor. Okay, see this Michael acceptor? See how we got a uh, double bond, right, and something can attack it, right, like do the Michael reaction, and then we make an enolate. 
Notice how on this side there are just no enolizable CHs, meaning like a, a CH, right, that could maybe form an enolate. That's what's going to, if you have that, if you have an enolizable CH, that's going to cause that thing called a Robinson reaction. So we'll see the Robinson next, uh, in about five, like two minutes, all right? The Robinson will happen if you have an enolizable CH on this side of the um, microacceptor. What about the other one? Let's look at that. Oh, look at that. The same kind of situation. We do not have an enolizable CH over here. There's no CHs except on the, the benzene, right? So we have the alkene, the, the, the benzene, double bonds, right? Three of them. There's no CH right there, right? That's not carbon. That's a carbon. There's no CHs here. That's what I mean by this statement at the bottom. The Michael acceptor lacks an enolizable CH. And that, if you, if you lack an enolizable CH, like we do here in these two examples, it will just do a simple Michael and then it stops, okay? But if it does have an enolizable CH opposite side of the alkene, then it undergoes this thing called a Robinson reaction. And that's what we'll talk about next, the Robinson reaction. Okay, so, now we're going to do B. I think we're on, what number are we? We're 11, right? 11, which is essentially the Michael and the Robinson. Reactions, okay? And now B is the Robinson reaction. Robinson reaction, uh, it's also called the Robinson annulation. Annulation. What the? What does that mean? Annulation means ring building. Ring building. So we're going to be able to build rings. So in organic chemistry lingo, annulation means a way to build rings, and that's going to be this thing called a Robinson reaction. All right. So. And the other thing about the Robinson, we already mentioned, it's the, the key requirement for the Robinson is that you have a Michael acceptor, right, the electrophile part, and it, it needs an enolizable CH. Alright, and what is this Robinson reaction? Um, so there's four steps here. And if, you're, if you do index cards, this is probably a good index card. Sure. Uh, I memorize them, or I suggest you, you memorize them. Memorize this sequence. And I also give them like letters. So it's like A, step A, step B, step C, right? So step A is going to be a Michael reaction, which we know what, we know what the Michael reaction is, right? The Michael reaction is just a 1,4 addition with a um, enolate, right? Okay, that's what we just talked about. Step B is going to be PT. What does PT mean? Um, you've seen that a number of times now in chapter 17, really, is where we introduced it. But it's proton transfer, okay? Now another w name for this in, this, in this reaction, that I like to use is re-enolization. It's technically a proton transfer, but it's also really going to be, you're going to have one enolate and you're going to turn it into another enolate. And if you're doing that, if you're converting an enolate to another enolate, what's a good name for that? Re Enolization, re-enolization. Okay, and then we have step C, which is an intramolecular aldol. Well, we had a whole topic on that this chapter, right? Intramolecular aldol is just an aldol that builds a ring between two functional groups in the same molecule. 
intramolecular elbow. Now step D, you should know, um, because what's the last step of every aldol? Remember that? Think about your aldol reactions. It's always like a two-step process. First it, the aldol occurs, and then the last step of an aldol is always dehydration. Or you can say minus H2O. Okay, so knowing the, the order of these re uh, reactions is really going to help us. Let's show an example. Okay, so now I'm going to draw my uh, Michael acceptor first. I'm going to draw that on the, on the left here. And a Michael donor on the right. Okay, so we have a Michael acceptor on the left and a Michael donor on the right. M A and M D, right? I'll, I'll tell you what the product is and then we'll step through the reactions. It's NaOAT, the same, same reagent, and uh, uh, sodium ethoxide, same as the Michael. And. And that's going to be the product. It's going to, so a couple things are going to happen here. Well, how many things are going to happen? Four things are going to happen, right? Okay, so let's step through these. And I, I, I'm going to label them A, B, C, and D as we, as we do them, all right? So first we're doing the Michael. Oh, yeah, also, this is really critical. Notice this thing on the Michael acceptor. And remember the, the requirement of the Robinson. Uh, is an enolizable CH. So here we have a CH3, so it was actually three CHs. Note the CH3. And this is, th these are alpha CHs, right? And this is what I was saying earlier, like, you know, the, the requirement of the Robinson is enolizable CHs on this side of the Michael acceptor, the side that's opposite of the alkene. If you don't got this, it's not going to do a Robinson, right? It's just going to do a Michael. So it'll it'll do the it'll do basically it would just do the first step. If you if you do not have like a CH or CH two or CH three here, it would just do the Michael and stop. But if you do have the uh, you know the CH three or something, then it's going to keep going and you're going to get the Robinson. That's what I was trying to say earlier. All right, so so let's start this off. Uh, first, we're doing A, right, which is the the uh, Michael reaction. And to start the Michael reaction, first you got to make an enolate because that's not a good nucleophile. So here it's it's you know the that proton is going to be taken off by your base. Let's draw that happen up here. Make a nice enolate. Nucleophile. Okay, and then we, we got our Michael acceptor. Let's redraw it. Okay, let's do our Michael reaction. All the Michael reaction is is this thing attacks that thing, right? So we're still in step A essentially. Uh, I'll go this way. All right, so so now the the enolate attacks the my, Michael acceptor. Double bond attacks here. Make an enolate. All right. See what we got. So, so essentially, the two molecules attached. And you, it did a Michael reaction, right? And normally, a Michael would stop now. Right, you just protonate your enolate, and in your final product would be a 1,5-dicarbonyl. One, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, we see that. That's good. So this is A. We're still in A. Okay, so now what's this B thing I was talking about? B. What is B? What was B? B was a proton transfer slash re-enolization. Well, you can kind of guess what's going to happen now. We have an enolate, and... 
we have enolizable CH on the other side, right? So maybe we'll just turn our enolate from pointing this way to pointing this way. All right, that's all the that's all B is re-enolization. It's technically a proton transfer because we're really going to move a proton basically from this side to the other side. That's going to give us a new enolate. But what if you might remember when we talked about PT before proton transfer PT. Um, do we show mechanisms of PTs? We love mechanisms. We love the concept of mechanisms, right? This is not. We're not showing a mechanism here, though, right? We never show a mechanism of a PT because the mechanism of a PT is really boring. It's really just protonate one side, deprotonate the other, and that would be kind of a waste of ink, right, to draw that. So we abbreviate that, and this is this is like a, a we'll say a non-mechanism. <laughs> That's not a PT is not really a mechanism. We could show it, you know, it's just going to, we would just show, you know, protonate with one side with ethanol and then deprotonate the other side with base. It's a two-step process, but that is kind of uh, a, a little wasteful and, and like, you know, we don't have to show that, it's not, not that exciting. So we just abbreviate the concept as PT, and that's how it happens to be step B, okay? What was step C now? Intramolecular aldol. Oh well, this is great because we're I'll square our final product here. This is great because now we have an enolate that's kind of set up to attack this ketone. Because we have a ketone, we have a ketone's electrophile, we have a nucleophilic enolate right over here. This can just swing in and attack the ketone you're set up to do it. What's, this, what's the ring size going to be? Well, that's nucleophilic carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? And I might as well say this right now. The Robinson will only make six member rings. It's, if you draw a five or a seven, you messed up. <laughs> like, like if this ring you're building is a, is a five or a seven, you messed up. Robinsons only make six member rings. I might even say that up here. I'll say Robinson annulation reaction. Six member ring only. Okay, it only makes six member rings, alright? The Robinson only makes six member rings. Okay, so so where where are we? Let's go step back through this. We started with the Michael Michael reaction, base takes proton making an enolate, and then the enolate attacks, that's your Michael reaction, just call these both step A. We did our PT, which is the uh, re-enolization of the enolate from one side to the other. Now we, we just did the intramolecular aldol, which is C. What does that give us? So, of course, this just attacks. Initially, we have a, what size ring? Always, always, always. A six member ring. Now we have an O minus. And now we have a ketone. Okay. Uh, this is a temporary intermediate. I'll even put brackets around it. Grab a proton from your ethanol or whatever. So O minus gets a proton from ethanol. Uh, Cool. Mechanism of that, of course, is ultra simple. Okay, and what is this intermediate? Um, it's it's like our halfway point of an aldol. It has a name. It's a beta hydroxy ketone. Remember that from the aldol. Okay. And then what's the last step of an aldol? We'll call this step D now. Dehydration, and it's really, of course, the the OH and the the beta OH and the alpha H 
this isn't the mechanism, this is just a <laughs> mnemonic aid to show we lose water, there's our water that's going away, right? And what does that give us? This is our final, 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 final product of the Robinson. Our cyclic alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. Cyclic alpha beta and saturated ketone product, which is the product of the Robinson. All right, very cool. Um, so that was the overall process. It's four steps. We showed the step A, Michael. Step B, proton transfer reenolization. Step C was the intramolecular aldol. Then we just kind of processed that intermediate with the protonation to make the beta hydroxy ketone. Step D was the dehydration minus H2O. And that is the Robinson reaction. Okay, so one last thing we'll do. Uh, we're going to show another Robinson annulation. Uh, but this time we're going to make it fun and go backwards. like a synthesis type thing. All right, let's try this out. I'm going to basically draw a product and say let's go backwards. Ketone, scissor cyclic, alpha beta unsaturated, ketone. Okay. Um, we're going to go backwards, and our goal as we go backwards is to eventually end up with a sufficient Michael donor, Michael acceptor pair. Okay? Alright, so when we're going backwards, we can use, remember these arrows? These are called retrosynthesis arrows. So this arrow basically means, this is the same as like saying like this, right? <laughs> this is the same, okay? So if we're doing step A, B, C, and D, what's the last step, which is the one we're going to assume here. It's going to be step D, right? And go look at your index card now, and what was the last step of the Robinson? It was dehydration, right? It was the minus H2O step. And this is, of course, an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. We can see the alpha carbon and the beta carbon. And this thing will be a beta hydroxy ketone, right? Because that's the, the intermediate step of an aldol, all right? That, and that'll also be the product of step C, right? Okay, so we're taking this, we're going to redraw it. The skeleton's going to be totally the same. So you got a methyl, you got a methyl, you got an ethyl, and we got a ketone, and we have a ketone. But this is a beta hydroxy ketone. So where's our beta hydroxy group? Well, that's the alpha carbon, right? And this is the beta carbon. So there's our beta hydroxy ketone product of the of step C, right? So all right, there's our, st there's the, you know, we, went, we did step D backwards, now let's do step C backwards. I'll go maybe downward, or I'll go this way. Step C. Okay, so step C was what? What was step C? Go look at your index card thing, right? Step C was the intramolecular aldo, intramolecular aldo. And so you can kind of visualize that when you do step C going backwards, it's going to be making the bond between the alpha and beta carbon, right? It's the bond between the alpha and the beta carbon. So it's essentially this bond. There's my little squiggly, right? That's the bond that's going to be created in the in step C, right? From 
enolate on this side, ketone on that side, right? Because you, you make it have an enolate, assume this is an enolate, attacking a ketone, and that would first you get an O minus, then it gets an OH, right? Protonated. So we're going just backwards from our little synthesis we were just showing. Alright, so step C, we go backwards, and now we got. Now the bond. Now was it, the first thing is that bond's going to be gone, right? <laughs> that bond will not be there anymore. So we got ketone. No, actually, the way to draw this. Now, I, my my recommendation is we're going to draw that as an enolate. So it's going to be. A, o minus enolate, right? There's an or enolate. And then this is just going to be tethered, methyl, okay, am I missing anything? I think I'm missing the ethyl group, okay. But see how, when we're, we're examining this to go backwards, like that bond will be the bond that's created in, in step C, because step C is you know, we're going, we're going backwards, and if you had this enolate, this enolate would attack, so the oxygen would kick in, the double bond would attack, and make this beta hydroxy ketone, right? All right, that's step C. What was step B now? Go look at your index card. The step B of the Robinson was the uh, PT reenolization. So we're going to assume now the double bonds on the other side. So that's all, all it is. It's, it's a PT, right? A proton transfer or reenolization. So now I'm just going to assume the double bonds on the other side. So we got O minus two carbons, carbon, carbon, carbon. Oh, uh, uh, it's, I just noticed something I missed. Uh, ketone, ketone. I missed the card. ketone up here. Okay, there we go. All right, we good. So now it's just like we have a ketone there, ethyl group, ketone here, right? All right. So all we did is we do the, the backwards step B. We assume. The enolate was one way, now the enolate's the other way. And so now, now this is the, the, uh, well, you know, we're almost done. All we have to do is step A and we're done, right? So we started going backwards from step D, then we did step C, we did step B, now we do step A. Okay, so to do step A, which is the Michael, and we're doing it backwards, right? Step A, which is the Michael. And remember, a Michael. Is a, is a reaction between a Michael donor and a Michael acceptor. Um, what we have to do is visualize where the Michael donor is and where the Michael acceptor is. And to do this, we're going to draw another squiggly line. And, and the squiggly line is going to be, so this, this is going to be the Michael donor side and this is going to be the Michael acceptor side. Um, and it's going to be between the, between the alpha carbon and the beta carbon right there. That's going to be the bond we're going to make. So I'm just going to draw a little squiggly line right there. All right, there's a squiggly line. And now I'm just going to imagine those two things broken up. All right. And, I, and the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assume the, I'm going to draw the enolate of the Michael donor side. That's going to be the Michael donor, right? This thing is going to be the Michael donor. But I'm going to draw the enolate version of this. So I'm going to assume an enolate right there. And then this is just going to be a, a double bond right there and a ketone right there, and that's pretty much it. So, all right, that's going to be essentially the Michael donor MD, but it's going to be the Michael donor enolate, whatever. Michael, what's the Michael acceptor? The uh, Michael acceptor is the left side of the molecule, and that's going to include a double bond right here and a ketone, or the ethyl group. All right, so we made it all the way, all the way back. Step D, 
step C, step B, step A, all going backwards. Uh, of course, if I wanted to show the mech, oh yeah, <laughs> don't forget your ethyl group here. There's an ethyl group there, right? Um, if we wanted to show the mechanism of this, I mean, it's not that uh, complicated. Of course, this just attacks here. If I ask you on a quiz, I'll probably not ask you the mechanism. Well, I, I don't know what I'll ask you, but the mechanisms of each of these steps are all pretty easy. But if I don't ask you for it, you don't have to show it, right? The only last thing is, of course, the, the Michael donor, you, you don't usually just start from an enolate. You would start from the ketone. And, and uh, so, so let's just go one step further. And this is also kind of, kind of step A, which is assuming you're starting from a ketone and then just use your base. What's the base we use? What's the, the standard reagent for a Robinson? It's uh, NaOET ethanol. Sodium ethoxide and ethanol. Okay, cool. Well, that was fun. That was a Robinson reaction going backwards. All right. Moving, I'm moving onward. We are entering chapter 19 now, which uh, sort of continues the theme a little bit of uh, carboxylic acid, or well, say carbonyls, acetyl window. And now we're going to talk about the carboxylic acid functional group. All right. And some of this is going to be related to also things like esters, and we're we're entering that whole conversation of of uh, Carboxylic acids and carboxylic acid-like functional groups, okay? Here's a couple of them. Uh, citric acid, you may be familiar with, is present in a lot of citrus fruits, like oranges and limes and stuff like that. It contributes to the acidity of citrus fruits. Acetyl salicylic acid is also called aspirin. It's a non-steroidal -stero anti-inflammatory drug. These are a couple other ones, uh, Advil or ibuprofen. Um, and also sodium naproxen. Um, so uh, carboxylic acids and also these like it's like a sodium salt of a carboxylic acid are very popular in a lot of uh, drugs. All right, cool. All right, so when you think about the naming of these things, um, and you know, naming is probably going to be probably going to show up on the final exam. So I wouldn't completely uh, ignore this part. Um, we haven't been testing a naming like on the quizzes, but it'll be on the final. So, anyway, uh, yeah, like if we have something like hexane, and you want to draw the name the uh, carboxylic acid, you'd say it's not hexane; it's hexanoic acid, right? So that's how a lot of the straight chain carboxylic acids are named. So you just take the the parent alkane and say end it with enoic acid. So, like this. You could say, well, it's ethanoic acid, right? It's two, like eth two carbons would be ethane, and this would be ethanoic acid. This would be uh, the parent would be propane, right? And so the name of the carboxylic acid would be propanoic acid. This would be four carbons, parent chains butane. So the name of the carboxylic acid would be butanoic acid, and this would be five carbons, one, two, three, four, five, maybe pentanoic acid, right? Okay, now, um, so the other thing is, like, for whatever reason, um, you know, most people would call this acetic acid. It's more of the common nomenclature. Nobody in the world <laughs> calls it ethanoic acid. This is just uh, the formal IUPAC naming system. So anyway, a lot of these have, have kind of like common names as well. And propanoic acid, I think this is also called propionic acid. So both of these names are used. Uh, butanoic acid is also called butyric acid. Pentanoic acid has a, another name, valeric acid. I, I never understood what that comes from <laughs> historically. But valeric acid is a uh, five-carbon carboxylic acid. Um, they take the highest priority in naming. So the idea of a na naming a carboxylic acid is you would find the parent chain. So this would be like 
hexanoic acid, and then we name the you, you, the uh, substituents uh, based on their position. It says probably uh, three chloroform methyl. Okay, and you put the substituents in alphabetical order: three chloroform methyl and uh, hexanoic acid. This one is probably something like propanoic acid, like maybe 2-bromo-propanoic acid. Now with the stereochemistry, you'd have to do the R and S. So we're not emphasizing that in or this organic 2 course, but the name would be uh, S, 2-bromo-propanoic acid. Okay. Now this, we have a, if you have a carboxylic acid on a benzene, it's called benzoic acid. So this thing is called a benzoic acid. And it looks like we have a 4-bromo and a 2-hydroxy. 4-bromo, 2-hydroxy, benzoic acid. 4-bromo, 2-hydroxy, benzoic acid. Okay, so there's other common carboxylic acids that have kind of weird names. And uh, I don't test on these. Uh, you should know them, especially for, for biochemistry and things like that. We've, we've mentioned this one before. If it does one carbon, it's formic, like maybe for, like, you know, like formaldehyde is a one carbon aldehyde. This is formic acid, and it's also the uh, poison in red ants. So if you ever get bit by a red ant, they are injecting formic acid into you, which stings. <laughs> uh, we already said this one is called what? Something acid. It's benzoic acid. This one is called oxalic acid. It's just a you know a dicarboxylic acid. Uh, this is interestingly. Um, the the calcium salt of this is like calcium two plus uh, and then oxalate which is O minus O minus uh, this th these look like this look, looks like popcorn but it's not popcorn these, these are kidney stones and calcium oxalate is is one of the main uh, components of kidney stones so hopefully you never have the joy of kidney stones. I have not, but I've, I've known a lot of people that have had them. It's a horribly painful thing because these things are basically passing through your body. These these uh, little rocky, razor sharp um, uh, kidney stones. Okay. This one is uh, I think this is citric acid. Yeah, citric acid. So it's a tricarboxylic acid. It's uh, Carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid, hydroxy group. This is the citrus flavor in a lot of citrus flu fruits. Uh, this is another one that's kind of common in uh, biochemistry. It's tartaric acid. Um, it's also found in wi wine. Um, now, of course, there's a couple stereoisomers here because you have two chiral centers. Uh, there's uh, three common stereoisomers. Um, there's the uh, uh, D, which remember D and minus means it rotates light to the left. L means it rotates light to the right. Um, and then there's also a meso form, which the meso actually has an internal plane of symmetry and it's, it's achiral. So this is an achiral molecule on the bottom and th this one's actually not present naturally. I think wine contains a mixture of L and, and D tartaric acid. It has a kind of a tart flavor, I guess, yeah. Uh, then there's also like super long carboxylic acids like dodecanoic acid or also called lauric acid. It's uh, found in like palm oils and coconut oils and stuff like that. It's uh, potentially antimicrobial. And uh, dodecanoic is, I think, 12? Is it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? Yeah. And it's also called lauric acid. Uh, but like dodecane is C12, right? So dodecanoic acid is this 12 carbon carboxylic acid. And carboxylic acids have this sort of planar sp2 hybridized structure. This is shown in formic acid. So bond angles are roughly 120 degrees. It's sp2 hybridized. And then uh, the, the uh, the bond length of the C double bond O is maybe a little shorter than like a normal C double bond O. And CHs are always kind of a shorter bond length also. All right. So it's basically an SP2 hybridized functional group. Um, they readily form hydrogen bond dimers, which basically means one carboxylic acid is attracted to another carboxylic acid through hydrogen bonding. Okay. And they form, uh, yeah, this, this kind of 
uh, it's like a pairing between two carboxylic acids. Now, in, if you extremely dilute a carboxylic acid, it will sort of break apart the dimer structure. Um, extremely dilute, the dimer can be broken up. So if it's, but if it's relatively concentrated, most of the carboxylic acid is in this dimeric form. Uh, they also, yeah, totally hydrogen bond to other hydrogen bond donating functional groups, and they're often carbox. They're often aqueous soluble because they, you know, they can hydrogen bond to water, and that that helps dissolve them. So carboxylic acids are often aqueous soluble. All right. Okay, molecular formula and like think about spectroscopy. You know, how do what do we know? How do we know if you have a, a carboxylic acid in your maybe your NMR? Hmm. And remember, we're getting back into NMR, so don't don't have forgotten your NMR. Um, there's a couple hints. Two two oxygens is a good sign. You might have a carboxylic acid. Degree of unsaturation. You know, it could be a ester as well, but there's there's hints in the NMR. All right. So the big thing is broad singlet around 10 to 12 ppm. That's the uh, a signature of a carboxylic acid. By C13 NMR, you usually have a peak around 180 or 190. So if, uh, usually in our, the NMR problems in this course, we're not doing carbon NMR, but I still you know bring it up just to remind you that it, exi it exists. This is an example of a proton NMR of, uh, what's this one called? Five carbons, one, two, three, four, five, pentanoic acid, right? And so you have this broad singlet around 11-ish ppm. Broad BS means broad singlet, disappears to D2O. And then the, these are really boring. You just use the N plus one rule to assign them. Here's just the carbon of that. That's the carboxylic acid, carbon. And then you have four carbons, one, two, three, four. Here's a fun one, try to do it. See if you can do it. If you can't get it, uh, come to office hours and ask me. It's pretty straightforward. If you do UN, I think that's UN equals one. So that's a you know, sign that you have a double bond O. See the 12 and you're like, hmm, that's a carboxylic acid right there. Everything else is almost just us using the integration and the splitting and then it comes out uh, th as the final answer. Um, Okay, uh, now the pKa of a carboxylic acid is pretty uh, low, I guess, for an organic functional group. Meaning, what does that mean? Does it make it acidic or not? I mean, the name carboxylic acid kind of implies acidity. And anyway, so the pKa is roughly 4 to 5 for most carboxylic acids. Um, and remember, our universal explanation for acidity in organic chemistry is not what we call resonance. It's usually something stabilizing the conjugate base. And it's often resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. So the conjugate base is the thing on the right. And, and so this thing is resonance stabilized. And that, that um, ultimately leads to the acidity of the parent functional group. So it's resonance, resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. So the relatively low pKa is due to resonance stabilization of the, carbox of the conjugate base. So, for example, a base can take off that proton to make its conjugate acid, and then we have a lot of stabilization of the reson of, of the conjugate base of the carboxylic acid, right? And that leads to the low pKa. Four to five is pretty pretty acidic. Um, nearby electron withdrawing groups make it even more acidic. So what does that mean? This just shows like, well, the formic acid versus acetic acid. Those are roughly around the same pKa. But what if we have like a chlorine, alpha chloroacetic acid? Oh, look at that. The pKa is much lower. What about two chlorines? Hmm, more acidic or less acidic? It's, it's even more acidic. What about trichloroacetic acid? That's 0 0.63. This is almost almost uh, a thousand times more acidic than like formic acid or than, than acetic acid, right? What if we have trifluoroacetic acid? It's three fluorines and acetic acid. That's even more acidic. So these electron withdrawing groups 
totally enhance the acidity, all right? And then what if we just have some more carbons? Well, that doesn't have much of an effect, right? So acetic acid versus propanoic acid, those are roughly the same acidity. The other thing is there's distance-dependent um, effects. So if the, the chlorine goes from like the alpha position to the beta position to the uh, gamma position, uh, we see kind of like the effect dissipate, right? And and that suggests usually that suggests something like inductive, right? Not resonance, but inductive for the uh, effect of the chlorine and its uh, the the effect of the chlorine on the uh, acidity. So the further it gets, the less of an effect there is. Okay, so what's the what's the rationale for why like this, this stuff's trifluoroacetic acid and pKa was like 0 0.3 or whatever. Um, what's the reason for that? And the reason is you, you, you always um, don't look at the carboxylic acid, you look at the conjugate base, right? So what we do is we assume, we, we assume an equilibrium with water and then we, we draw the conjugate base. It's a carbo this thing's called a carboxylate. It's the, carb the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid. And basically what happens is the, the, uh, the fluorines are pulling the electron density through the molecule and, sta and that causes a stabilizing effect. So fluorines stabilize the negative car charge through the SIG bonding system, okay? And that, that's hugely important and, and explains the massively low pKa, 0.23 versus like four for a normal carboxylic acid. It also occurs for uh, substituted benzoic acids. So what we have here is benzoic acid in the middle, that's like 4.2. And then we have something that's like a slight electron donating group. Uh, a methyl is a slight electron donating group. And a chlorine is a slight electron withdrawing group, right? So they're at the four position. And you can see that the donating group actually makes it less acidic and the withdrawing group chlorine makes it more acidic not a ton but but definitely noticeably more acidic than the parent carboxylic acid so that we have this effect in in um, carboxylic acids also sorry uh, uh, benzoic acids benzoic acids so why do we, why is this considered the conjugate base always considered the conjugate base so like if I have an electron withdrawing group, it's sort of pulling the negative charge through the molecule. It's a complementary interaction because this is pulling and we have something to pull and so it's stabilized a little bit. But if you have a donating group, it's kind of like you have negative charge pointing one way and a donating group points the other way. That's not complementary and it's slightly destabilized. That's an easy way to remember this for benzoic acids. Carboxylic acids can be bases as well. So that's weird, right? A carboxylic acid could actually s accept protons in addition to donate protons. But only one of the oxygens is protonated. So what does this mean? Like, if I have a carboxylic acid, it's in the middle here, I could assume, and we have two potential sites to protonate, the top oxygen and the bottom oxygen. If we, we protonate the bottom right one, that's not observed, and the reason is because it's not uh, it's not like stabilized by anything. Whereas if we protonate the other carboxylic acid, we um, we can do that because it makes a resonance stabilized species. This is technically an RSCC also, right? Because I could draw a carbocation resonance structure as well. The point is this is totally resonance stabilized. The one on the left is not. There's no resonance stabilization due to you know the proton being provided there. Okay, so when you have a carboxylic acid, you always protonate the double bond O. That's a that's a good thing to memorize. You're, we're going to see that in a few minutes. So don't protonate the OH. Always protonate the do C double bond O. The other thing is that. Um, Carboxylic acids can be uh, deprotonated, and you can like pull off that proton and leave a metal behind. And this just shows, like naproxen, which is a, you know, that's basically a leave, right? The the pharmaceutical. Um, 
is not sold as naproxen usually. Um, what what they do in the kind of um, the, the drug naproxen is sold as a sodium salt. So they use a base. They use sodium hydroxide, takes the proton, leaves a sodium anion and sodium cation. And this is a, called a carboxylate. We already talked about that. Carboxylate. You have carboxylic acid and carboxylate. And the carboxylate is a uh, is a it, um, the commonly used form in a lot of drugs. Why would that be? One of the main reasons is the the sodium salts are actually a lot you know, more crystalline. It's like easier to deal with a white crystalline powder. The carboxylic acids are often a little more waxy. So sometimes you have a just the physical state makes it more convenient to deal with the carboxylic acid. Um, the other thing is that the um, the uh, sometimes like you know when you're trying to absorb the drug when you, you take it like as a pill in your proteic environment in your stomach uh, these these things dissolve easier so the sodium salt actually dissolves better like in the acidic environment of your stomach so a lot of taking a drug is is having it dissolve successfully, especially if it's an orally available drug. So that's another reason. All right. All right. So we just finished the PowerPoint component of Chapter 19, which is about carboxylic acids, right? So now we're going to go into the reactions either to make carboxylic acids or uh, to like reactions we can do of carboxylic acids, right? All right, so how do we prepare carboxylic acids? And um, there's a couple ways. And some of this is actually kind of old. You, you already know, so know this. So one thing is we can oxidize, bracket o bracket oxidize, a primary alcohol, right? We can oxidize primary alcohols. Also, number five means, you know, uh, concepts one through four were in the PowerPoint is one, two, three, and four. All right, so oxidation of a primary alcohol. Remember, and, and this is usually introduced in organic one, that if we have a primary alcohol, there's a couple steps of oxidation. Uh, like, I can oxidize a primary alcohol to an aldehyde and can all furthermore oxidize an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, right? So this is basically from organic one. Yeah, and, and how do we, how do we uh, cause the, the single step oxidation of a primary alcohol to an aldehyde? What was that? It was a reagent that you should know. And it's uh, PCC, right? Remember PCC? PCC and like dichloromethane. PCC and dichloromethane is how you go from a primary alcohol to an aldehyde. You may or may not remember, but from an aldehyde, there's a way to go to carboxylic acid. And that is using something called CRO3, chromium trioxide. PCC is also a chromium based reagent, so it's like this is this is chromium. That's chromium. Uh, CrO3 in acid water will take a aldehyde up to a carboxylic acid. But it, is there a way I can go directly from a primary alcohol all the way up to a carboxylic acid? And that we can do that. And that is also using CrO3. So CrO3 will go all the way up from a primary alcohol to a carboxylic acid. Okay. And there's also another way to do this using silver oxide. The book mentions this. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna mention it also. I'm not gonna show a mechanism for this. Um, but silver oxide and ammonium hydroxide is a way that actually transforms a uh, aldehyde all the way up to a carboxylic acid. No mechanism for this one. The mechanisms for the chromium reagents are really easy, so that's why we usually emphasize that. Okay, 
But the big thing, the big thing about these reactions with the, like beyond going PCC and like using CrO3 and acid is you need acid water to go all the way up to the carboxylic acid. So water is needed, H2O is needed in the mechanism. And why, why is that? Um, what I'll do is I'll show, I'm going to introduce this and then I'll continue it uh, next time. Basically though, in, in a nutshell, so if we have, we have a primary alcohol, right? And we're going to oxidize it up to the aldehyde first. That's actually really easy. This is organic one stuff using CrO3 and H3O plus. Okay. Um, the mechanism I'll, I'll, I'll do next time, but essentially oxygen attacks chromium and then we... Uh, chromium is a kind of a leaving group on oxygen and then we're able to uh, remove this, this proton and then we get the aldehyde, right? But, I'll, I'll, I'll start it. What's the first step of the mechanism? Yeah, it attacks, right? Okay. Now, the thing about going further from the aldehyde up to the carboxylic acid, and this is where I'll just, I'll just introduce it and then stop, is that we also use CrO3. It's all part of the reaction mixture. This is tec technically an intermediate even. All right. The thing is, this is not a nucleophile. So how, like, we can't do the same thing that we did here, all right? So what happens is in the presence of acid water, H3O+, plus, you might remember something happens from chapter 17. This is chapter 17. Does something happen to aldehydes in the presence of, acid, of water and like catalytic acid? You have to think back from chapter 17 and see that, yes, there's something called a hydrate, which is like a nucleophilic addition of water. It's basically, essentially water attacks this, okay? And now, now it's like this thing is basically a, like an, uh, a pair of alcohols, and then now the alcohols react just like this alcohol did, and then it, it, it continues. So I will... Uh, I will continue this next time and fill in the details. But this, these details are actually something you should already know because this was taught in Organic One of like how what, what does this do? Well, now this is an uh, alcohol also, and so it's going to attack. And then you have your couple steps, and that gives you the carboxylic acid. So the things for me to do next time are like the first part, which is actually really easy, and then the second part. This is all Organic One, okay? All right, so now you know how we can go from a primary alcohol all the way to a carboxylic acid. Or if you, if you make an aldehyde, you can also go from the aldehyde to the carboxylic acid, also using CrO3. And the big thing is this intermediate. And what's the name of the intermediate I told you? The name of the intermediate is called a hydrate. Okay. Cool. So we'll fill in the details next time.